Publius Servilius Vatia Asoricus, Consul 48 and 41 BCE. The son of one of Sulla's stalwarts, Servilius Asoricus the Younger was one of the most significant political power brokers during the civil wars of the 40s BCE. A staunch opponent of the First Triumvirate, particularly of Pompey, Servilius Asoricus stunned the Roman political establishment when he declared for Caesar in 49 BCE. Although he is not known today as one of the leading optimates, his reputation down to 50 was such that he was frequently mentioned in the same breath as Cato the Younger, Bibulus, and Metellus Scipio. Once he was aligned with Caesar, he shared the consulship of 48 with him and put forth an immense effort to keep Caesar's more radical followers in line, effectively facing down another Catalinarian conspiracy. When Caesar was assassinated, Servilius Asarchus shifted his support back to the Senate, but he did so in a manner which set him up to be one of Rome's leading men. In late 44 or early 43, Servilius Asarchus arranged for young Octavian to become engaged to his daughter, Servilia. However, they would never take any wedding vows, and Octavian had to break off the engagement to Servilia to form the Second Triumvirate. Octavian did, however, want to maintain his link with the powerful consular and insisted upon his appointment to a second consulship in 41. Octavian fully expected that Servilius Asaricus would faithfully and forcefully represent his interest, but his conduct once in office borders on being incomprehensible. Servilius Asaricus's lack of activity during the Paracene War is not only a puzzle for historians, but has led to the perception that the man was a weak, opportunistic tremor, i.e. someone who rides the coattails of more talented people and shifts his allegiance at the drop of a hat. Here I will argue that Servilius Asaricus was far from weak and that the dismissive treatment he received in the histories for his conduct in 41 owes to him having alienated both Octavian and Antony. For what it's worth, Servilius Asaricus most likely did not have a friendship with Lepidus, but that really doesn't matter too much. Servilius Asaricus's father, Publius Servilius Vatia, fought throughout the 80s on behalf of Sulla. He was able to survive many defeats before Sulla eventually came to his rescue and they secured power in Rome. The elder Servilius served as consul in 79, won a great victory, and was rewarded with the cognum in Asaricus, which his son went on to inherit. Servilius Asaricus also had an uncle who was in the Senate, his name was Marcus Servilius Vatia. He seems to have held a junior office around 100 BCE as a moneyer. We have a coin with his name on it. But aside from that, he doesn't really have much of a career to speak of. He might have died young or retired from politics. As for Servilius Asaricus the Younger, he was born into a very favorable position. When he came of age, this was at a time when the optimates were still in the driver's seat of Roman politics. However, that would soon change with the rise of the First Triumvirate. Another factor in his favor that helped him despite the existence of the First Triumvirate is that his father was still alive and that he would become Princeps Senatus in 55 until his death in 44. So Servilius Asaricus the Younger had a lot of name recognition and he also had his father around who could give him advice and also lend him a great deal of prestige. Servilius went on to marry Junia Prima a sister of Brutus and niece of Cato, and that meant that he was especially well connected within the conservative faction. So not only was his father a legend from the days of Sulla, but he was married into the family of Brutus and Cato. So needless to say, he had it made and he had a definite home within the faction of the Optimates. Servilius Asaricus the Younger makes his debut in history in 57 BCE. In this year, he was assigned to work with the proconsular governor Aulus Gabinius in Judea. Gabinius was a protege of Pompey and had been the consul of 58. He would then go on to serve for the next three years in Judea. Servilius Asaricus, however, was only there for a single year. Due to the short nature of his service, I surmise that Servilius Asaricus must have been serving as keister during this time. Those assignments usually only lasted for one year. This meant that he would have been responsible primarily for holding very minor commands and managing the province's finance. Now, most likely, Servilius Asaricus would be 28 or 29 years old, which would put him being born around 85 or so BCE.
At any rate, there was plenty to be done. Back when Pompey had passed through the area and annexed it, he had come upon a civil war between the former governor of the area, former king John Harkinus II, and his usurper Aristobulus II. Pompey had determined that Harkinus would make the better client because he was weaker, and so he and Gabinius, who was with him at the time, had empowered Harkinus. So Harkinus was still in charge going into 57, but there was a strong challenge to his authority from the deposed Aristobulus. Aristobulus decided to seize the city of Alexandrinum, which was a familiar family stronghold in a place that he had fought from before. During this time, Servilius will serve alongside of a young Mark Antony and Gabinius's son. The three of them will work together, with Servilius probably in command due to holding an official office, and they will lead an army to Alexandrinum and directly defeat the rebel Aristobulus. Meanwhile, Gabinius the consul was off with another army reducing another part of the country. Servilius and his friends managed to capture and send Hyrcanus back to Rome. The man who stood out the most in this action was Mark Antony, who physically ascended the citadel and seized Her uh, Aristobulus in person. But Servilius most likely was the man who was in overall command, given his actual holding of an office at the time. By 56, Servilius Asarchus the Younger was back in Rome, and he would quickly emerge as one of the most vocal critics of the First Triumvirate. Whether he was simply inheriting his role as an optimate, or whether his hatred of the First Triumvirate was spurred by his experiences in Judea, where he worked under Gabinius, one of Pompey's protégés, and then served alongside of Mark Antony, Caesar's cousin, is not entirely clear. However, it is clear that Servilius was not a fan of either Pompey or Clodius, the gang leader who initially worked on behalf of the First Triumvirate. In February 56, there was a major riot caused by Clodius, and Servilius joined other well-known critics of the Triumvirate, such as Bibulus, the former consul, Cato the Younger, Curio, Livonius, in blaming Pompey for these disturbances and calling upon him to use his power and his influence to deal with the problems posed by Clodius. For the rest of the tumultuous 50s, Servilius Asarchus continued the rise to the curses of Norum. He managed to win an election to the office of Praetor in 54, and he had every hope of one day achieving the consulship. He also got to see his father continue to achieve honors. His father held a censorship in this time and also was elected to the office of Princeps Senatus. It didn't have the weight that it used to have, but it was still a great honor and a way to really build up the family's name and reputation. So Servilius Asarchus was living at a time when both he and his father were actively accruing honors and advancing. However, because of his opposition to the First Triumvirate, he did not receive a consulship when it was, quote, his year. So usually you can hold a consulship within five years of being praetor. But in 49, Servilius Asarchus was not consul. One of the more interesting facts of Servilius Asarchus's career is that despite being a vocal critic of the First Triumvirate, he had always been on good terms with Gaius Julius Caesar. There was probably about a 15-year age gap between the two men, and yet, for a very long time, they had been close friends. Now, Caesar had a reputation for being able to make friends with younger people, so that's not surprising in of itself. Most likely, they met through the College of Augurs, where Caesar, of course, was a senior figure and later became Pontifex Maximus. So Caesar was extremely knowledgeable about Roman religion, and perhaps he passed some of that wisdom down to Servilius Asarchus, and that was the basis of their friendship. We simply don't know. But often, personal feelings and politics were two very different things in Rome. That's why it's so hard often for scholars of the Roman Republic to explain in a satisfactory manner how factionalism actually worked, because we often have very tangled and complicated relations between the various leading figures of the state. As the standoff between Caesar and the Senate progressed, however, no one assumed that Servilius Asarchus's allegiance would be in question. His father was still alive, and his father was the last remaining figure of the Solon Order. Caesar had always lived his life in opposition to the Solon Order, so you would think that Servilius Asarchus the Younger would be a given for the cause of the Senate, that 
his allegiance was without question and would be immediate and just a simple given. So when Servilius Asarchus did declare that he was going to side with Caesar, this was a shock to everyone. And this might account for how he has been portrayed later, since he effectively turned traitor on the cause that he had been a part of for his entire life, for the first 40-something years of his life. When he sided with Caesar, this was a major coup for Caesar, because one thing that Caesar lacked was the support of most of the senior men in the Senate. Most of the backers of Caesar were younger men who had only held minor offices or who had not even yet entered the Senate. So Caesar was very short on heavy hitters, and by attracting the support of someone like Servilius Asarchus, who is a potential consular, this was a major get. And Caesar, of course, would reward him for his allegiance. Now, we of course don't know what uh, Servilius Asarchus's father was doing at the time, but because of his advanced stage, it's possible that he was more or less just a cipher at this time. We don't really know. In terms of why Servilius Asarchus the Younger decided to switch sides, it appears that much like Cicero, he had the analysis that Caesar's victory was inevitable. Unlike Cicero, however, he decided to act on that and to join Caesar wholeheartedly. The question then becomes, was this a matter of opportunism or was there something more happening? Well, it's impossible to know. But again, we do know that Servilius Asarchus very much liked Caesar and hated Pompey. So in a civil war that was effectively Caesar versus Pompey, perhaps it was that personal consideration that made him declare for Caesar. Or the fact that he knew that Caesar would almost certainly give him the consulship that he had been wanting. And if you think that Caesar is going to win anyway, why not get ahead of the curb? So that's exactly what Servilius Asarchus did. One common way to summarize how Caesar conducted the civil war between 49 and 45 is that he commanded in the field against his enemies while he left Antony in charge in Rome. That's mostly true, but for the first year or so, the arrangement was a little bit different, and the man left in charge in Rome was in fact Servilius Asarchus the Younger. When he returned to Rome and kicked out Pompey in 49, Caesar held consular elections for the next year and arranged for himself and Servilius to be the only two candidates. Servilius was duly elected easily as the plebeian consul, and it was understood that he would hold down the fort while Caesar went after Pompey and his various generals. Caesar was able to go after the army in Spain, what he called the army without a general, conquer it, and then move on to Greece, where he fought a very hard-fought campaign against Pompey, one where he almost lost a couple of different times. Back in Italy during this time in 48, there were many disagreements among the Caesarians as to what policies to pursue, and those policy differences among the various Caesarians would really boil over when there was the possibility that Caesar might be defeated in Greece and that their whole cause might fall apart. One person in particular who was at odds with Servilius was the praetor Marcus Caelius Rufus. Caelius was an old friend of Cicero. He was very charismatic and a convincing speaker. His hope was that he would enact sweeping debt relief measures and that this would build up support from the populace. However, as Servilius understood, this would also mean strong opposition from the propertied class and might raise up a revolt at a time when the Caesarian cause was on the knife's edge. We also have to imagine that given his upbringing and his long allegiance with the conservative cause, that Servilius Asarchus was not necessarily the person who was most sympathetic to the cause of the indebted. There's also a very strong possibility that the two men had hated each other for a while. We know that both of them could be rather high strung, and in fact, when Caelius was trying to provide, preside over a vote to bring debt relief, Servilius actually physically approached him carrying an axe and tried to break up his chair, the chair he was sitting on as a magistrate. The two men nearly got into a fight, and surprisingly, it was their guards who were armed who broke the uh, two men up and prevented them from actually brawling. Um, so. Servilius Asarchus literally almost axe-murdered a fellow official in order to prevent debt relief. So that shows you 
possibly that he is a somewhat awkward fit for the Caesarian faction, which tended to try to appeal to common people and their concerns, which often centered around debt. It's not often that we can speak of a consul who tried to commit an axe murder in public, but what followed this thwarted attempt at killing a praetor with an axe was actually more interesting. After the failed attempt at axe murder, Servilius went back to the Senate and asked them to pass the Senatus Consultum Ultimum on the grounds that Caelius had gone beyond the pale and that he was a traitor to the state. So effectively, Servilius was waving the bloody shirt and saying that Caelius was the one planning violence, not him. And so using the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, or as it's sometimes called the Final Decree, Servilius's consul called upon the services of some legionaries happened to be passing through in order to restore order. So this gave him a preponderance of force in terms of armed soldiers. In the meantime, it turns out that Caelius was plotting something, and he was plotting it alongside of a fairly unlikely ally, Titus Anius Milo, a former praetor who had led the street gang opposed to Clodius. That is to say that Milo's gang was actually a gang funded by the Optimates. So back in the 50s, most likely Servilius and Milo had been allies, and now they found themselves on different sides of an issue. Servilius, ostensibly serving as the Caesarian consul, was opposing debt relief by force, whereas Milo was now trying to seek debt relief by force of arms. It was an incredible turn of affairs. In the meantime, Servilius empowered a praetor, Quintus Pettius, to lead out an army to put down Caelius's revolt. Pettius led a very well-conducted campaign. He managed to defeat both men in detail rather than allowing them to unite. And so this led to the victory of Servilius and the Caesarian Senate. What's interesting about this affair is that the conduct of the whole thing from start to finish, with the exception of Servilius bringing an ax to the party, is that it is almost identical to the way that Cicero handled the Catalinarian conspiracy 15 years earlier. Now, we don't know, of course, if there was an extensive investigation by Servilius, but otherwise, this very much fits the pattern, and it's regrettable that we don't have more details of how this all unfolded. Having defeated Caelius and Milo, Servilius now turned his remaining time as consul to the task of setting up a legal framework under which Caesar could serve as dictator with Antony as master of horse on a recurring basis. Normally, dictatorships were only for six months at a time, and Caesar also did not want to be dictator for life necessarily, so Servilius was trying to walk a tightrope in order to get an arrangement that would be politically satisfactory and also make sure that Caesar had the powers that he needed. This, of course, would eventually set the stage for Mark Antony to govern Rome while Caesar was out fighting his remaining battles after 48. However, it was during this time, if not earlier, that Servilius Asaricus developed a major animosity with Mark Antony. Now, it's possible that this beef dated back to the, their time together in Judea, where Mark Antony got most of the credit for seizing Aristobulus. But it's also possible that their rivalry only dated to this period, where Servilius Asaricus was reduced to a minor role in Antony's Senate. We see a glimpse of this in Cicero's letters where he said that Servilius is the only other man in Rome who can be relied upon to speak out against Antony. There was initially a peace after the Ides of March when Caesar was assassinated where the liberatores or the assassins went out and made an agreement with Antony and other Caesareans. But after several months that peace broke down and at that time Servilius Asaricus, despite his clear allegiance to Caesar, now sided with the Senate against Antony. However, he did not simply go with the stronger faction, but instead he went with the faction where he clearly saw an advantage to be had. He, of course, had been Caesar's colleague as consul and was senior within the faction, but also had clear ties to the other side as well. So he had a lot to offer, and it was probably along those lines that he approached young Octavian, Caesar's teenage heir, and offered to have Octavian engaged to his daughter Servilia. So at this time, that, that 
engagement was announced publicly, and this would be the height of Servilius Asaricus's power, where he has now put himself in a position to be the father-in-law to the major inheritor of Caesar's fortune and his reputation with the legions. However, this was not to come to fruition in the way that Servilius Asaricus had imagined. The engagement of Octavian and Servilia was announced sometime around the summer of 43, and this would mark the absolute pinnacle of Servilius Asaricus the Younger's influence. Yet, this period was not to last very long, no more than three to four months. At the time, however, things were looking perfect. Mark Antony had been defeated and he was besieged at Mutina. His time was running short. In the meantime, his chief lieutenants in the east, his brother Gaius and Dolabella had also been dealt with. So Antony's cause was largely dead. Yet Octavian seems to have become convinced that in fact he was being played by the Senate and that in time he would be gotten rid of the way that Antony had been. And so rather than wait around and take a risk, he decided instead to cast in his lot with Antony. So in late 43, around September or October, Octavian, Antony, and Lepidus announced the formation of the Second Triumvirate. They used their combined forces to enforce a prescription, and they went on to fight a war against Brutus and Cassius in Greece. As part of this agreement, famously, there was the prescription list where each member of the Triumvirate got to have some of the people they hated put to death. But another big part of it is that Octavian needed to establish a marriage alliance with Antony. And so in order to make that happen, he had to break off his engagement with Servilia so he could get engaged to Fulvia's daughter, Claudia. This was Fulvia's daughter by her first husband, Clodius, the famous gang leader. Most likely, given that Servilius Asaricus had absolutely loathed Clodius, this was not something that he wanted to hear. And you could also argue that this was a double betrayal of Servilius Asaricus, since he was someone who had really brought a lot to the table for Caesar and therefore to Octavian. He also, in theory, could have been a viable member of a new triumvirate as someone who had connections with the other side and had a legitimate resume as a Caesarian. It's neat needless to say also, if Octavian was concerned about balancing out Antony's power, who better than a man who had opposed him consistently? Now, from Antony's perspective, of course, Servilius Asaricus would be a non-starter, but given the situation at Mutena, where Octavian clearly held more cards, putting this guy as a part of the triumvirate would have been a coup. Perhaps also, though, Servilius Asaricus was just a bit too clever and ambitious for Octavian's liking. And so, this is why Octavian and Antony agreed upon Lepidus, who was a threat to neither one of them. As for Servilius Asaricus, he had always had a grudge with Antony, at least for the last several years, and I think there's a good case to be made that he now extended that grudge to Octavian, who of course had gone behind his back to make a secret compact with a man that he had despised for a number of years. And we'll see, perhaps, that grudge in action very soon. About a year after the formation of the Second Triumvirate, Octavian and Antony led their forces to Greece, where they were successful against Brutus and Cassius, at the Battle of Philippi in 42. For the following year, 41, the two men were concerned with the demobilization of the various formations they'd had to raise to fight that war, and also the existing formations that Caesar had raised, which had not yet been settled properly. And so while Octavian would have a heavy role in dealing with that in Italy, the two men each knew that the consuls, in theory, would be the legal authorities responsible for such a move and so they were determined to put reliable men in place. There was still some distrust between Antony and Octavian, especially since Octavian had gotten equal credit for Philippi, even though he had actually performed poorly and Antony had more or less won the battle by himself. So in order to find loyal men, both decided to choose people they knew they could rely upon. For Antony, his younger brother Lucius was the obvious choice. Octavian, however, decided to take a bit of a risk and turn to the man he had spurned, Servilius Asaricus. He thought that this would renew their bond together and that 
Servilius Asarcus would need would bring a certain amount of experience that both he and Lucius Antonius lacked. So in theory, that was a smart move, and we also have to keep in mind Servilius Asarcus has a long history of not being a toady for Antony. He had shown legitimate leadership skills back in 48, and he was not the kind of guy who would be physically intimidated by someone else if he's willing to take an axe to another man. Where We know Lucius was much like Mark Antony in the sense that he's very physically imposing, and perhaps much more so than Mark Antony, Lucius was willing to beat someone's ass. So despite having every qualification in the world on paper, though, Servilius Asarcus would turn out to be an absolutely awful choice. And here's why. The task of settling veterans and finding plots of land for them in Italy fell to the two consuls and Octavian. However, this land distribution quickly broke down into a conflict as both sides accused the other side of getting all the good land. And this boiling conflict was fueled by Lucius Antonius pinning all the blame on Octavian. This would of course eventually lead to an open conflict called either the Perusine or Fulvian War. One thing that the sources all agree upon is that the two driving forces in the Roman state, basically the two effective consuls were Lucius Antonius and Antony's wife Fulvia. In a previous video on Lucius Antonius, I talked about how this is unfair to him as it deprives him of agency. And it is also, of course, a barb against Mark Antony. One of the accusations against him from Octavian being that Antony was always controlled by strong women like Fulvia and later Cleopatra. However, there's actually a third victim of the decision to say that Fulvia is responsible for this war. And that third victim is Servilius Asaurus the Younger. We actually have no idea what he was doing during this time. He's not really mentioned in the accounts, except they'll say he was consul and then completely ignore him and basically say that he was a non-factor and that all of the business of Rome was being handled by Lucius and Fulvia. In fact, when Lucius led his army against Rome, the man who was tasked with defending the city was the third triumvir, Lepidus, who predictably, of course, failed. The fighting then was between Lucius Antonius and Octavian's generals. Even Antony's commanders who did not actually engage, men like Ventidius, feature more prominently in accounts of this than the sitting consul, Servilius Asarchus. So that leads to a big question. Why was this man so uninvolved in these events? What happened? Was he simply hedging his bets and waiting to see who would win? Was he on some unknown assignment somewhere? So was he, say, in Northern Italy putting down bandits or something at the time? Was he ill? Did he simply not care about who won and he just thought that this was a contest between two enemies? Did he simply lack the kind of sway he would need with Caesarian troops to achieve anything? I.e., was he just not in their favor to the point where he couldn't try to deal with the situation in any way? Well, we don't know. The fact is we simply don't know. But it is likely that Octavian felt slighted by his would-be former father-in-law's conduct. And so not only do we not know what happens to Servilius Asarcus afterwards, we lose all track of him. So after 41, the man fades from history completely. We have no idea how he finished out his term in office. We don't know what he did during that term in office. And we have no clue whether he uh, died then or much later. Now, most likely, given how long his father lived, his father lived until 44. If he lived for the same amount of time, he most likely lived until about the mid-20s. And yet, we still have no indication of uh, when he might have died. To recapitulate the argument that I've been advancing throughout this video, Servilius Asaurus the Younger is not someone who should be overlooked. From 49 to 41, he was one of the most important men in the Roman Senate. He was one of the most important figures in the entire period of the civil wars, despite the fact that he had no legions behind him. He's at least as important as Cicero in this period, and perhaps was actually more important in terms of his political impact. His defection to Caesar in 49 was a massive coup for the Caesarian cause. It gave Caesar a reliable and powerful ally and helped to legitimate his cause at a time when he was very much short-staffed. He then suppressed Caelius in 48, and that also helped the Caesarian cause immensely. 
Had Caelius succeeded, he would have become a very powerful member of the faction, and he was the kind of guy who was very much self-seeking and might have posed problems for Caesar down the line, not to mention how this would have very much upset the property classes of Italy, that same group that Lucius Antonius would later get riled up during the dispute with Octavian. By gaining a marriage alliance with Octavian during the inheritance dispute and then the conflict between Octavian and Antony, Servilius Asaricus showed that he knew exactly when to strike and how, that he had the political instincts to go for the jugular and put himself in a position to be at the top. He had political skill and ambition. He's not the kind of guy who was incompetent. Just because he ultimately failed in the end, we should not mistake that for him lacking ability. He, of course, got unlucky during the secret dealings of the Second Triumvirate, and perhaps we could even say that he was screwed over by Octavian. The thing that he's most known for, however, and the thing that is responsible for his reputation as being a trimmer, is that during the Paracene War, he was inactive. He doesn't seem to have done anything at all during that time, at least so far as our sources tell us. But if we look at the rest of his career, this seems extraordinarily out of character. This is the kind of guy who would take an axe to an enemy in a literal sense, not the kind of guy to sit by and watch the world burn. So how do we account for this? Well, as I hinted earlier, I believe that the accounts of the Paracene War written in such a way as to serve the interest of Octavian and to demean everyone that he felt had slighted him. So of course it demeans Mark Antony by not only making his brother out to be a complete lunatic, but also making both of the Antonys out to be weak because they're being driven by the machinations of this woman, Fulvia. Servilius Asaricus is then, of course, completely dismissed and emasculated because he's not even mentioned anymore. So Octavian clearly felt that the man had failed. But Servilius Asaricus must have had his own reasons for doing whatever it was that he did. We just simply don't know them, and those reasons are irretrievable now because he ultimately was not an ally of Octavian. And of course, he also was on poor terms with Antony. Antony's memory has been preserved in many ways through Plutarch, but the memory of the people who opposed Octavian and Antony, but were a part of the faction, those guys kind of got lost in the lurch. And the person, one of the biggest fishes who was lost in the lurch was in fact Servilius Asaricus. But in general, this dismissive notion that many scholars have that Servilius Asaricus was a mere tremor, that he was a mere uh, functionary who was just an opportunist, I just don't think that holds up the close scrutiny. And in fact, we have to recognize him for what he was, a major player who simply was not able to advance himself in the end because he lacked the sway with the legions that he would need to really make himself one of the top two or three guys in the Roman state.